Hi, and welcome to 5620, which is our intervention with children and youth with emotional behavioral disorders. My name is Chris Matatal, and I'll be the instructor for this course. And I just wanted to take a few minutes in this short video to introduce, introduce the course and three things. I want to, uh, I'm going to look at, a, we're going to do a, have a brief chat about the nature of this course. We're going to talk a little bit about language and terminology, generally speaking. But then we're going to finally turn to a little bit about not everything is a disorder, and I want us to have a, a clear understanding of what emotional behavioral disorders is uh, from a current emerging definition. But let me just say, first of all, when I talk about the format of this course, would I be too blunt or too candid to say that I won't be holding anybody's hand? I, I, I don't spoon feed people in my undergraduate courses and I certainly don't in my graduate courses. In fact, one of the things you're going to notice right away about this course is that there's quite a bit of reading and the textbook is quite detailed. And then you'll you, you may you may be tempted to say, well, I didn't use all of that all of that material, I didn't use everything that you has assigned for reading. And that's true. I'm not going to give you an exam, I'm not going to test you on all that material. This material is actually for you. It's not for me, it's for you. And so all of this reading you do, all of the research you do, all the writing you do is actually just for you. And we're required to give a mark or a grade at the end, it's just what we do. But the truth of the matter is, that everything that I put together, the textbook I use, the other readings I'll, I'll send your way, other resources that I put on the website, these are for you to help you with students who have emotional and behavioral disorders. So that's the first thing, and I just I just want you to know that. Okay, I would like to take you to the website, which is open beside me here, <clears throat> and uh, you'll see me scroll down through it. So this is the uh, title page, obviously. It's not, it's not fully uh, open to you yet, all of it, and you won't see everything, and I don't make everything visible all at once, and... Um, even though I sent you the syllabus and the outline, you, I talked a lot about um, challenge. I talked a little bit about challenge questions in there. Those are not available to you yet. They'll be coming to you. But just let me take you down through this a little bit. I think you can see my mouse here. Uh, you will find the syllabus there, the course outline, and then there's a section called "What I Found." Look what I found, and that's for you to post great resources there. You can post 500 times if you want, but this is for you to share with your colleagues excellent resources that you found that deal with kids who have emotional behavioral disorders. So as we go through the course, please feel free to put stuff there and take stuff there. I often say the motto of every uh, good teacher should be uh, big, borrow, and steal. So this is an opportunity for you to big, borrow, and steal. And then Newsformer, if there's any uh, announcements or whatever, I may put them on there, but I don't use Newsform very often. But you'll see there's four units. The first unit is beginning to be populated. And by the way, this is a brand new course. It, it was taught before, but the emphasis has changed quite a bit, and we've expanded it a bit. And because of my own expertise in this area, they've allowed me to, to, to grow the course quite a bit. So Unit 1 has three parts to it, and I've put here uh, what is what you're expected to know for Unit 1, and you can just, I, I would like to be make it fit, but... It, it's close to fit. And you'll see everything that you have to do there. I'll leave that up to you. I'm not going to read the syllabus for you. We're not going to go over the syllabus. I'll leave all that to you. But I will say here, you're going to start to see this area populated. You will be given a, a challenge question, and you'll see a heading in there that says challenge question number one. And I usually give choice. You'll go in, you'll look at this. I usually try, try to be a little provocative. I'll give you a challenge question. You'll write up your response, and then you'll post it here, Unit 1 Challenge Question Discussion Form. You'll go in there, you'll read one another's responses, read at least two people's papers after they're posted, and then respond maybe to one or two, as many as you like. But in the whole course, you're required to respond to um, two in the whole course. You'll have four of these challenge questions to do in the next four months. And I really do want you to think, slow down and spend some time thinking and responding um, as best as you can. And you'll, you'll receive more information on how to do that in a little bit. So the second thing I wanted to talk to you about is a little bit about language and terminology. One of the things that I will dock marks for is when you don't use people-first language. I always require people-first language in everything that I write. So people-first language is when you say the, the boy with ADHD or the child with uh, anxiety disorder or Thomas has a learning disability or Thomas has such and such. We don't say the ADHD kid or the depressed kid or the schizophrenic child or the wheelchair kid. I used to hear that all the time, people referring to the special needs kid or the exceptional child. 
it's still out there a lot, especially in older videos but uh, and resources, but we're seeing less and less of it because people are trying to put the person before the disability and not allow the... And, and there's another thing too, terminology, we'll get that in a second. Do not allow the disorder or the disability to define the child, but to say the child with, which is only part of who they are. And that brings me to terminology. There is a lot of hot debate going on regarding terminology. Should we use the term special education? Should we use the term exceptional? Should we use disability or different ability or diverse abilities? What should we use? And, and so it's more than semantics, actually. It has a lot to do... Um, rather with trying to be accurate, trying to say what is it or what condition or what situation or what unique uh, um, perspectives are we talking about. So I do want you to use people first language and I do want you to be familiar with the DSM-5 says, the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual which you have a link to on the Moodle site uh, and in your um, in your syllabus rather it will take you right to the DSM online, DSM-5, and in there you can find everything you need to know about all these different types of disorders and how they're classified, how they're diagnosed, prevalence and all the rest, and the language that they use. Psychologists have been very careful over the last 25 years to try to get it right. Um, mental retardation has officially been dropped from the DSM-5. Some people applaud that. Some people say, well, that was probably the more accurate term, really. But we're not going to get into debating language right now. You may in your challenge question, but we'll get into more on that later. Um, let me see what else I want to talk about. So it's, it, it is a big deal to me that you use terminology correctly and you use people first language. I'll give you one chance if you mess up and say, yeah, the LD kid or the ADHD kid. I'll note that in your writing and I'll say, okay, that's your last warning. If you if you continue to use uh, disability first language, then I'll I will dock you marks. Real serious guy, obviously. Finally, let's talk about um, I want to wrap up a little bit and talk about the definition of emotional behavioral disorders. We often say emotional and behavioral disorders or emotional or uh, behavioral disorders, but often a lot of people say emotional behavioral disorders, one or the other, because often they're comorbid or they coexist, an emotional disorder or behavioral disorder, or they're, t or they're together. And we'll learn more about that in the course, but know primarily that this is not a classification course, not a, not a uh, course that talks about each individual uh, category. That's what the DSM-5 is for. Mostly this course is about what do we do about it, right? And as you read through your syllabus, you're going to see that you're going to have an opportunity to take, to bite off uh, a disorder or a uh, classification of your own, define it, find the causes, find the prevalence, and then what should teachers do about it. So we want this course to be very practical. So that brings me finally to, on your website you see here, the definition of emotional behavioral disorder. And I'm just going to pop this up. I hope this comes up on the screen. And hopefully... There's enough room for me to fit on the screen. If not, I'll move myself over. So this is called the Emerging Alternate Definition of EBD. And the reason I like this, uh, it came from Kaufman's last textbook, which was the textbook for this course uh, previous to this year, before I got hold of this course. This is an excellent definition, and we're going to go over it just for a moment before I end this video. So... This is actually formed by the National Mental Health and Special Education Coalition in the United States. It is American, but we do use it in Canada. And I want to start right at part one. There's two parts. And by the way, uh, in my undergraduate course, all of my students were required to memorize this word for word, every word, and it was on the midterm and on the final exam. And you might say, what? That's ludicrous. You mean you believe in rote learning? Um, you, you realize um, I may shake up some of the things that you hold dear in this course, at least I hope I do, and one of them is that rote learning is not a bad thing. And and the other one, of course, is uh, the myth of multiple intelligences, but we're not going to get into the myth of multiple intelligences today. I digress. We'll stick on the topic. And if you want to ask me more about uh, the myth of multiple intelligences and learning styles, you can talk to me about that later. hope I didn't rustle any feathers there. But anyway, let's go on to the definition, because this is very important. This is where I want to start the course. So I'm going to read it, actually. I hope, I hope you can see it on your screen. I hope I did this right. But emotional behavioral disorders, the term itself, emotional behavioral disorder, means a disability characterized by emotional 
or behavioral responses, and I like this part, in school programs that are so different from appropriate. So different from appropriate. Appropriate age, appropriate culture, and ethnic norms. Yes, we talk about norms in psychology a lot. We talk about, is there something called normal? Well, there is something by by prevalence and by percentages, yes, that's generally in the ballpark of normal range, which, by the way, is a large range. Understand that the normal range is a large range. But we're talking about children who are so different from appropriate norms, and it affects, adversely affects, not positively affects, but adversely affects educational performance, including academic, social, vocational, or personal skills. Now, understand, if a child is ADHD, or they've been diagnosed with ADHD, inattentive type, for instance, and it does not adversely affect their education or their relationships, do they have a disorder? By definition, by this definition, no. If it's not adversely affecting them, it's, what's the, what's the, it's, it's just that they're diverse. They learn differently. They're within that normal range. So we've got to be careful. And one of the challenge questions that I toyed with was to ask whether or not the prevalence of ADHD and other disabilities is the fault of teachers and education systems and um, financial arrangements or formats that we use, um, formulas that we use in our school districts. Maybe that's causing higher prevalence rates of ADHD, causing higher prevalence rates of autism and so on, because people are looking for funding. Oh, let's not get into that. We'll get into that later when we talk about challenge question. Let's go back to the definition. So we're talking about a child who is, uh, and I love this, that's so different from appropriate, so different from the norms, that it adversely affects them in three areas. Okay. And you'll see here we have ABC. So this condition that they have is more than temporary. I love that. It's more than temporary. It's more than a temporary expected response to stressful events in the environment. All children have stressful events. All of us have stressful events that affect us in some way. Maybe our neighbor's house burned down and we're suffering from anxiety and we can't sleep. Well, if that condition continues for months and months and months, then we're talking at something that's disordered behavior because it's adversely affecting a person and it is so different from appropriate. But of course we would expect it to affect a child if it happened and it would, it would affect the child for some time. But it will become more than temporary if it's a disorder. Secondly, it's, and it has to be A, B, and C here, it is consistently exhibited in more than one place. So the child at school is acting this way or having these problems, this anxiety, this depression, this ADHD or whatever, or uh, conduct disorder, but they're also having it at home, they're having it at the mall, they're having it at other places. So it's exhibited in two different settings, one of, one of which has to be a school setting. Thirdly, it persists, and that's very important. We give an intervention, but it persists. We try something, but it persists. It just doesn't end, even though we've tried our best efforts which begs a lot of questions. It persists despite individualized intervention, interventions within the educational program, unless in the judgment of the school team and their history, such intervention would be ineffective. So we do allow the school team to have a considerable amount of input on whether something is disordered or abnormal. I know some of you don't like those terms, but those are terms that we use in psychology. And emotional behavioral disorders can coexist with other disabilities. And then, and part two goes on to talk a little bit about children with schizophrenia, which is rare, by the way. Schizophrenia is usually not diagnosed until after the age of 18, but we do see it in children. And if we do see it in children, it's generally very serious because the earlier something onsets, the more serious it is. Okay, so that's the definition. And that's a little bit about the introduction to this course. I really hope you enjoy it. I hope you have a lot of questions. I hope you have a lot of input. I hope you have a lot of comments. I hope this course becomes uh, important to you. And I hope we get a chance to get together some Saturday to come together to chat, to share our, our resources and such. And I'm going to be sending out some uh, correspondence with you shortly to try to arrange a Saturday. So, really good seeing you. I am looking forward to this course with you. See you for now.